Let my blood turn this sad to mud What you waiting for? I'm ready, ready right now It's a bus out, it's a stick up kid well, Justin, I appreciate you stopping in. Anytime anybody ever takes time out of their day to come on the show, I 100% appreciate it. So let's go ahead and get in with the questions. Um, sure. How did you get into martial arts? Uh, you know, it's uh, when I was like seven or eight years old, uh, me and my sister were, were playing around at a park. Uh, we're kind of like wrestling, tussling a little bit. And uh, I remember like I threw her on the ground or something, this, this grown man came over to me and told me not to pick up my sister and if if i wanted to uh if i wanted to like throw somebody around i should join wrestling or it, something like that at a park and i was already a, a wwf wrestling fan at the time so like hell yeah that's what i want to do so uh, my mom signed me up for a local club program and i showed up to practice you know expecting to be jumping off the top rope yep. and instead we're on a soft mat and uh I didn't really care for it at first, mostly because I didn't want to wear a singlet, yep. uh, but it changed the, it, that, that moment of my life changed the rest of my life uh, from then on forward. Well, that's actually kind of cool. Um, my uncle was actually in the WWF for a while. Um, he was oh, one of nice. the moon dogs and uh, okay. him and uh, Mick Foley actually went to wrestling school together and they oh, lived no together shit. for like almost two years uh, oh, wow. traveling all over. So um, yeah. <clears throat> I can definitely McCoy, see uh, all time legend. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And a very nice guy too. I do. I do have to say that. And sure. so, uh, so you got into, you said you got into wrestling. Yes. And when, when did you transfer into more martial arts also? I mean, because wrestling and martial arts, they're all really tied together, especially nowadays, but where did you make a transition somewhere between the two? So after my senior year of high school, uh, you know, I went to the state finals and the funny part is, you know, I, I, uh, I wrestled Drakkar Klaus in, in the state finals uh, and uh, I lost Drakkar, you know, now he's in the UFC. Um, but after that, after, after that match, you know, I was working at a gym called Steel City. After my senior year of wrestling, I, uh, uh, the, the, the MMA instructor at Steel City was really adamant about me taking an MMA fight. Didn't really want to, didn't really care to, uh, but he ended up talking me into it. I took it with no training and I lost. I got submitted by a guillotine in the first, in the first round uh, shooting a double leg. So I don't want to try this once, lose and never do it again. So I was like, all right, I'll take another one. So allegedly I was training, which I mean, look, looking back, it wasn't proper training, um, but I was training a little bit, working on some basic striking and uh, I took another fight. And we went to decision. I won a decision. And then uh, the rest is history after that, man. I got addicted to it right away. And uh, when I won like seven fights in a row after that. Uh, then I pursued a 50 M uh, amateur MMA uh, fight career, uh, 50 amateur fights. Then I turned pro, and my last pro fight was my 25th. So that's kind of how the stories went. Yeah, 50 uh, amateur fights. That's quite a bit. Yeah, in Michigan, uh, the Wild West. There was no uh, regulation. You could fight every single day if you wanted to, as long as they're like, they would just have shows on the weekend. You go sign up at, they match somebody against their similar weight and they have you fight. And uh, call those the old wild, wild west days because uh, they used to get crazy without a commission. Oh yeah. That's when they was fighting mostly in bars or, you know, yeah. uh, you know, really kind of, you know, anywhere that somebody would let them come in there and fight. You know, you sit there and blood filled, you know, stain mats and everything. Oh, yeah, definitely. And yeah, it's, and, and, I'm, and I'm happy to be a part of that generation. I'm proud to be a part of that generation because these kids nowadays don't have any clue how wild this used to be. I used to do eight man tournaments fighting two, three times in a night. So uh, the kids these days don't understand that or appreciate it. Well, when did you actually uh, get into your MMA career? Like even as an amateur, when did you start that? Uh, yeah, that was in 2007. Uh, my first fight was in June of 2007. And uh, yeah, that, that's right after I got, like I said, right after I was done with high school, uh, I, I started transitioning over. And uh, yeah, that was that. Wow. Yeah, because the um, multiple mi uh, fight tournaments is actually uh, kind of interesting. I mean, that goes back to the really beginning days of, you know, the UFC or, you know, even Valet Tudo and things like that. 
appreciate that. We used to fight essentially for free just to find out who the toughest guy was. You know what I mean? Now everyone's just looking for a payday, which is fine as well. I, I get it. But back in the day, MMA was more raw. I was sitting there talking to um, Jeff Speakman. Um, you know, he's the um, 5.0 Kempo instructor. Pretty much came up with that system. And um, he was in a few movies and stuff in the 90s, a perfect weapon, things like that. And he was sitting there saying that it's no longer mixed martial arts. He goes, it's uh, MMF, mixed martial fighting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's so different now because, you know, before you can come in with one, you could be really, you know, really good at one, uh, one art and, you know, have success. But now it's not like that anymore. And, you know, the UFC was created to see which discipline was going to be, you know, the most dominant discipline in the world. And, uh, you know, now everyone's just training in MMA, you know, MMA wrestling is different from collegiate style or folk style wrestling, you know, boxing, MMA boxing is different from, you know, uh, traditional boxing, kickboxing as well. I mean, the fundamentals are all similar, um, yeah. but it's, it, it's all different, even stance wise. You know what I mean? Like as, as from a boxer, having a bladed stance, if he, he has a bladed stance in MMA fight, he's going to get that front leg chopped up. So yep. um, I, I do believe it's evolved into its own sport. Or its own well, let me ask you this. Do you think there's any style out there uh, that has stayed the same? Like what about like Muay Thai? Has it pretty much stayed the same or did it have to involve somewhat to get in there? I think it's all changed because in Muay Thai, you know, there's a lot of times to where you throw single strikes or single kicks. And, you know, I went to Thailand a couple of years ago, I went to a, to a professional Muay Thai fight. And, you know, they're throwing single, they're not setting their kicks up. They just go kick for kick, kick for kick. You do that in rep, you do that in MMA, you're going to get taken down. Someone's going to catch a kick or make you miss and you're going to get your back taken. So, you know, they're taking the traditional uh, Muay Thai kickboxing, but you have to set your kicks up nowadays. You can't, if you throw a body kick or even a leg kick, you know, and, and you get caught, what are you going to do? So again, yeah. it's a lot easier to, to counter or catch a kick when the, when there's no punches behind it. And that's more traditional Muay Thai. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really think I'm, I'm sure like wrestling, you know, I'll, uh, rap, ah, man, it, it's all changed a little bit. It's all changed a little bit and it's evolved into it, into the whole, whole uh, its own MMA sport. Yeah. Because just like you said, you know, the uh, beginning of the UFC and uh, when it came out, I was in high school and, you know, it was all about, you know, well, this style against this style, this style against this style, really before there really was the whole M MMA until you had like the guys coming over from Ballet Tudo, which they was kind of used to that. But, you know, when you had the jujitsu artist against the karate artist or the sumo, you know, against the a Kempo guy, you know, that really was kind of like showing, you know, all right, let's see what what these styles really can do in a sure. real you know altercation. You know, especially in the the beginning days, you know, when there was grown strikes still going on and, yep. you know, pretty much hair pulling or whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah, it, it was crazy back then, man. I'm glad that I'm glad there's regulations because nowadays with how strong some of these athletes and competitors are, we, they, people would die. And at oh, the end 100%. of the day, we're, simu we're simulating life and death at the end of the day. Um, but at the end of the day, we also want to go home with, to our family, too. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, let me ask you a question. Like, you just brought that up. It is a life or death situation. How did, how does that make you feel? I mean, because especially in the um, at the level of fighting that you're at, you're at the you know the upper crust of the fighting. Do you get kind of you know worried for each fight, or, or how does that mindset set for you? Ah, uh, man, like I'm not afraid of death because in fighting, you know what I mean, like. I've gotten my ass whipped some really bad times and is, I mean, that, it, that, that part doesn't intimidate me if anything. I mean, I know it's a possibility, but uh, there's a better possibility that I get in a car wreck driving to the gym than actually dying in the gym. You know what I mean? So that really doesn't affect me now getting, I get hurt. I might get hurt. You know, Chell Sonnen said it best is you're going to get hurt. You're going to get tired. That's just, as soon as you accept that everything else in the sport is easy. And, uh, you know, after 75 MMA fights, you know, I feel I've accepted that and it is what it is, man. It's, I mean, just, it's just like, if you're a fireman, you know, eventually you're going to have, or a doctor, you're eventually going to have a patient that dies. I mean, it's inevitable. So once you start getting over these humps of, of what if, and, Oh, I could get hurt. I could lose. Once you get over that stuff, everything else, no matter what you're in, whether you're a doctor talking about a patient, whether you're an MMA fighter, worrying about getting hurt, um, it, it all at the, at the end of the day, eventually it is going to happen. 
So it's just when it's going to happen. Yeah. That goes back to like, um, you know, motorcycle riders, you know, I've known, you know, guys have been riding for 50 years and it's not when you get in, a, not if you get in a wreck or you lay your bike down, it's when it's oh, always going to happen. Like my uh, brother's father-in-law, he was riding for like 40 something years, never had a, never had a wreck, never laid his bike down. And he was turning the corner around my brother's house and there was some sand there and just laid it down. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's exactly right. Exactly. Just like riding a, you know, a street bike. It's a great analogy because you get, eventually it is going to lay down. So once you get over that fear, everything else is easy, I guess. Out of those uh, 70, how, how many, you said 50? Uh, to, be amateur exact, fights? I, to be exact on paper, I think I had 47 amateur fights. Yeah. 50 sounds better though. <laughs> 50 does sound better. Uh, so let me ask you this with those let's just say 50 we'll throw that out there just for the fun of it uh did you have any um did you have any uh, <clears throat> you know uh accidents during those i mean did you have any uh hard hits or did you have any you know you know broken bones or things like oh, that man. yeah i have you know it's again just just going through you know it's through those 50 fights, I've broken my left hand three times. I've broken my right hand twice. I've broken my left foot twice, broke my right foot twice. Um, I, I mean, I, I had a, I had a fracture from training in my sternum. I shot in on a double leg and, uh, uh, uh um, a guy need me right in the chest. Uh, Martin Campman, I was getting ready for, he was getting ready for, uh, I was one of Martin Campman's training partners when he was getting ready for, uh, What's his name? Country guy, long hair. He fought George St. Pierre for the title in a controversial decision. Why can't Was it, um, not Roy, uh, not, not Roy, uh, but his shotgun, or his yeah. name was like a truck or something like that. Like some kind of semi, I don't remember, but long story short, you know, he's like, all right, I just need you uh, Johnny Hendricks. Um, I, I need you to just come in and shoot doubles on me the whole time. Cause Johnny is an incredible wrestler. Very first double I shoot, knees me right in the face, knocks me out. It's like, God damn. Yeah, I've been knocked down in the gym. Never iced to where, like, I don't know what's going on, but falling back, wake up and, like, trying to pull guys, you know, pull guard, thinking that, you know, I'm in a fight. Uh, but never not to where I didn't know where I was at. But, yeah, I mean, again, we're playing with fire. You know, I've been choked yeah. unconscious in the gym. I've been – when you're working with the caliber of athletes that I work with or that I am, I'm not saying I'm the UFC world champion, but I'm still pretty tough. And you know what? We, we, we hurt each other. Every, you know, unfortunately, we hurt each other every day. And my goal going to the gym now and that I'm in my 30s is going to be able to train and not get hurt. So I'm very particular about my opponents because through my tw through my 20s, every time I came to the gym, I was getting in a fight. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I've, I've had some knockdown drag out fights for free, you know, and I've knocked some of my training partners out that I regret. I've tried to hurt some of my training partners and in turn, I get hurt. You know, uh, maybe if I had 10 MMA fights, I was in my prime, but as I told Dana White, as I told Sean Shelby, as I told everybody throughout my career, I'll fight anybody, anytime, anywhere I show up. That's why I've said in my hometown, enjoying, having a good time, enjoying myself. My manager calls, he's like, hey, we have to fight. Hey, can you make 145 in three weeks? And I'm like, no, I can't. And my manager says, well, you told Sean Shelby that you would make any weight, anytime, anywhere and fight anybody. You know, three weeks later, I, I remember it being, you know, I'll say, I have some videos that are disgusting, like, I can't even walk. I'm crying. Like I'm done. I'm done. My coach fortunately is pushing me through the last, it took us 15 hours of cutting weight. It was terrible. I make weight. I gas out in the first three minutes of the round, still drop him, still almost finish him twice. Next fight after that, Gabriel Benitez, two week notice, have COVID. Him and I both got COVID. And the following, once I got cleared for COVID, we fought the following week. I couldn't even train, you know, for, for that fight because he could, and, and, and you know, he was in a bad spot too. Cause I, I believe he got COVID like the week before I did and sent us both up for failure. Then Devontae Smith, I get on three day notice, Devontae Smith, big one for long 145. You know, it's like I was set up to lose that fight. And then finally they gave me a reasonable matchup against Charles Rosa on full notice. And hey man, I'll fight anybody, anytime, anywhere. And uh, that's my montage. And that's what I'm going to keep doing, win or lose. Well, just like you brought up, you know, everybody's like, oh, you're 32, you're in your prime. Well, that's also depends on uh, how hard you rode your body up until that 32 years. I mean, I, I played college football. I wrestled college for four years. You know, I have over 70 MMA fights. Uh, you know, I have a couple, you know, amateur boxing fights, you know, a couple amateur kickboxing matches. Like I, I've been around the block. I've traveled the world. I've fought, 
I fought in the UK, I fought in India, I fought in you know, all over the United States. Like, you know, my resume speaks for itself. So, you know, when I, when I start getting, you know, these emails of how, how shitty of a fighter I am, that's it, a bummer because these guys don't know the work I've put in and all the fights I have put in. I understand that I'm at the later part of my career. Um, you know, and I, obviously I'm not performing to where, to where I used to be. Um, but it's not because I'm not training. It's just because, you know, my body's getting slower. I, every day I wake up, my feet hurt from breaking, you know, I, I hit something the wrong way. My hand hurts for another, like, I don't recover like I used to. And, and again, when you put the mileage on your body, like I have, it's just, you know, I have, it's something I have to accept because it's very hard for me to accept I'm 32 years old and I'm starting to slow down. It, it's a big time bummer, but the sooner I accept it, you know, the better off I can move forward from it. So, you know, we've talked about, you know, uh, how you got into, you know, fighting and martial arts and you got through that through wrestling. And then you went into, you know, the MMA training <clears throat> and you're still a professional fighter. What else has that led into your life? You know, like what else are you doing with your martial arts and things like that? Uh, you know, I do a lot of personal training. I help people lose weight. I help people gain weight. You know, it's a, I, I'm very, you know, uh, I'm very proud. I have a lot of, a lot of kids, you know, I took over the, the kids program, you know, about seven or eight years ago. Well, the problem with, or not the problem, the great thing about taking over the kids program eight years ago or nine years ago, even that the kids are growing up now. And now I have a slew of young killers. You know, I had a freshman I've been working with. He's never wrestled before besides with me. He's never competitively wrestled before in his life. He's a freshman in high school this year. He takes second in the state as a freshman. It's like, and, and, and a lot of the, I mean, it's, it's obviously his hard work that he's putting in, but I've put a lot of time into this kid. And that's just, and Zion, Zion, man, he's, he's, he's a savage, you know, mark my words right now. You heard it here first. This kid doesn't stay injured. He's going to be in the UFC. He has, he has a bright future in MMA. He's an, he's a world-class grappler at 14 years old. You know, I got another boy named Marcus. He's the same age as Zion. Same thing. He, all he wants to do is fight, man. I got, man, it's just the, the, the possibilities are endless and I can help these kids learn from my mistakes because Believe it or not, with 75 MMA fights, you might not believe this, but I've made a couple of mistakes along the way. And uh, I can help these kids grow and not make those same mistakes. You know, I was cock strong when I was, you know, 18 years old, literally on spot. Anybody wanted to fight, you know, uh, you know, in a ring. I didn't care if you're a heavyweight, whether you're smaller than me, whether you're a pro. We used to do pro-am mix-ups. You know, I fought in Illinois and I ended up fighting a professional. I was an amateur. I was like 10 fights deep in my amateur career and I was put with a professional. You know what I mean? That happened a bunch. You know, Scott Bickerstaff fought him when I was an amateur. He was a pro. Um, uh, there's another there's another guy. Uh, there's there's a couple of them. But regardless of all that, you know, and most of my fights I didn't even train for. I just showed up and fought, which I regret. You know what I mean? Like if you're not training for a fight. It's a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. You know, is there's you know, out of those 70 fights, you know, do you regret one having that many fights? you know, to, is there things that you regret that you could have done better? And, you know, somewhat you did say that, you know, you just going in there straight off, you know, not even training, you know, that's, that's definitely not going to, uh, you know, go favor for you. I mean, I'm sure it happened uh, quite a few bit. I mean, <clears throat> what was your amateur record? 34. Hold on. Let me think 34, 11, or let me think 32, 14, it was either 34, 11 and two or 32, 14 and two. I can't remember exactly what it was, something like that. But I had like, I had slightly over 30 wins and I had over 10 losses in two yeah, drops. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a heck of an average. <laughs> no matter what way you look as, at it. You know, I fought as big, even as a pro, you know, I have, I have, you know, if you look at my resume, I have one or two fights at 185. I have one fight at 215. Like, the, the thing is this, my ego gets the better of me a lot. Like or lose when you show up to fight, you fucking show up, you know, and a lot of people sit, talk about being a tough guy and then they get challenged to a fight. I mean, Troy Lampson, you know, he was a freaking incredible Midwest fighter. He was, he was uh, like, I think he was 18 and 0 as an amateur. He was seven and 0 as a pro. And I knew that I could beat him. And, you know, I already had a couple losses as a pro and he kept dogging me and ditching me and, you know, so I just got online. I just every single day, I'd write him a message and I'd make a video. And eventually he had to answer the call. And I, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm the baddest guy on the block, but I'll fight the baddest guy on the block any day of the week. Well, sometimes just being the baddest guy is just showing up for the fight, I guess. That's in, in that. And, and I agree with that. And I really wish MMA fans would understand that, you know, out of 
I have prof- I have friends that are professional football players. I have prof- friends that are professional baseball players. You know, to me, MMA fans are the worst. There's nothing worse than MMA. It is disgusting how they nitpick every little thing that they've never done anything in their life. Guys go out of their way to send me messages about how much I suck with, you know, a hundred followers. You know, it's like, what are you talking about, dude? What if like, it's disgusting how the hate messages, you know, that I've gotten, you know what? I got a weird one yesterday. It was, I don't even know the guy, but he's a former Bellator champion sends me something like you're the definition of a fake tough guy. It was a uh, former Bellator champion, Will Brooks. I was like, it was, I was so caught off guard by it. He's like, there's things called fake tough guys and you're the epitome of it or something like that. It's like, what? And so I messaged him back. I was like, this is the most random message I've ever gotten. And for a former world champion to send me this, I'm honored or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, well, you're going out of your way to shit on me because you know, my career isn't going great right now. Hey, yeah, but if you sit there and think about it, I mean, he's on your radar. Why is he even, you know, why are you even on his radar? Why is he, yeah, like you said, why is he taking time out of his day just to write you this message? And that's, and that, and that was my thought too. And that's why I was like, hey, look, I'm honored that you take your time out of this day, but grow up. You know what? What he's probably doing, it's, and it's so standard and so typical. He sees that, you know, hey, look, Justin was in the UFC and, and, and watch me on this in case he doesn't see it. Oh, I'm going to try to poke him so he says something back. So we can develop this feud. So, you know, cause he's, you know, he's on a little heater right now. He's won like three or four in a row, you know, and. Now, do, let me ask you this. Does that happen a lot? Is there like a inner feud, you know, going between Bellator, UFC, PFL, you know, uh, what global combat, you know, there's, you know, 20 million different organizations out there now, but. I don't think it's an organizational feud because, you know, what, whether you fight in one whether you fight in Ryzen, whether you fight in UFC, whether you fight in PFL, these are all world-class athletes. Yeah. You understand? Like, that's what people don't understand. People think, oh, like you fight in the PFL and not the UFC. Listen, UFC champions are losing in the PFL. PFL is a world-class organization. The UFC is not better than the PFL by any means. You know what I mean? The UFC is bigger brand, but I mean, you look at, Jeremy Stevens has just lost to Clay Collard. You know, Rory McDonald lost last year. What's his name? Clay Collard beat Anthony Pettis, former UFC champion. You know what I mean? Like these guys from the UFC think that, you know, like, you know, and these guys are incredible fighters and they're all great guys and it's not slander. But I think that like Rory McDonald may have thought, and I don't know, so don't quote me on it, but maybe if he went to the PFL, he'd get easier matchups and win a million dollars. These organizations have killers killers bro yep. like there's no ray cooper just lost in the first yeah. round of the season and i was there yep. case i couldn't believe it like who is this guy that he's fighting nobody knows this guy <laughs> are getting better kayla harrison just went to decision when does kayla harrison go to decision yep exactly exactly right. these fighters then, are- uh, who is it Cy? yes Cy. Uh, yeah. that, that, well, that me and him talk a lot online anyway but and, but he's i mean he is fun to watch he, his side yeah. is an incredible, lengthy, long striker, and he is a magician when it comes to trying to take him down. If, man, this guy is – he's one of the best defensive wrestlers in the gym right now. Yeah, I was going to say how slinky, you know, linky that he is. But if you go into his Instagram and he's training – that dude will never, you never see him not looking like somebody just sprayed him down with a water hose. Dude, he's, he, he, he busts his <laughs> off. I was very fortunate that, you know, I was there, you know, uh, cage side to watch, watch and he fight. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's the thing, dude, guys like that, they're, we're putting the time, but it's just to reiterate, man, it's yeah. To, to, to there, there's no cross feuds. I mean, everybody wants to go like Bellator versus UFC. Everyone wants to see it. Of course. But yeah. being a guy that's in the mix of it all, like look at Michael Chandler. When Michael Chandler went to the UFC, he wasn't even the Bellator champion, I don't think. He might have been, but I don't think he was. I think he lost. Eddie Alvarez, Bellator champion, um, you know, became a UFC champion, you know, lost to Conor McGregor. Like, it's just, man, it's, I wish that these smaller organizations, and I, when I say smaller, I mean, it's, smaller is not the right word, but less publicized organizations yeah. 
I wish their fighters would get this respect that the UFC guys are getting because these guys yeah, are- maybe not just maybe not better or whatever, but just not up front in the news. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Like these guys, man, it's I, I mean, I get it. UFC's mainstream, um, but PFL is doing incredible things. The format they have to me yep. is the best format in MMA. It is incredible. Yes. I actually kind of like that whole, you know, uh, series of fighting, you know, how, you know, it's a point system. And if you do this first round knockouts or anything like that, first round wins, you get points. And, you know, sure. it's, it's a, it's a different outtake on it, really. It's, and that's the thing in the UFC, a lot of times, you know, and this is, this is, and, and I'll be honest about my Charles Rosa fight. Like there's a lot of things I could have done different, but I was so afraid to lose. I didn't want to expose myself. So you know, with how much money I had on the line in the fight, I knew my contract was on the line. I was afraid to do anything dr- dramatic be- in case I got caught, you know, and I was so, so I was fighting not to win, but I was fighting not to lose. And, you know, in turn for, for as long as I could, but instead I was like, Oh, I don't want to make this mistake. I don't want to make that mistake. That's I feel some UFC fights can be boring because people are so afraid to lose because if you lose, you lose your job. And you, and you only get paid half of what it is. You fight for rise and you look at some of these guys that have 500 records, they're going out there and putting it all on the line they're, because whether they win or lose, they're honored. And, you know, it's, especially American fans, they're the worst. You lose. When I won, when I won my UFC debut, I had over a thousand messages saying congratulations. Yeah. I lost. I'd have a couple hundred times. Like people are going, like, it's just, it's just, it's, it's just unreal, man. And, uh, I go off on tangents, so excuse me, but yeah, it's no. it, it, you know, just the amount of time that you guys put in training and the amount of times that, you know, like you said, be, even before putting your life on the line or your health on the line and things like that. And for somebody just to sit there and say, you know, oh, you suck or, you know, you're not putting in the effort that, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> that they think. They don't, they're not there watching you train. The other person that was in the PFL that went over, uh, just had a fight in the bare knuckle was uh, Alexander Houston. Oh my gosh, man. What a stud. He just got a first, <laughs> or he got a big knockout there. And, you know, I was very fortunate enough to go and corner Jordan Christensen in the BKFC to see what it's all about. That shit yep. is brutal, man. These, these guys are, these, this, these are, these are street fights, man. These guys yep. are fucking. They're awesome. I, I love watching them. You said that you said that you're, uh, you know, that you're into training now, also with, um, you know, younger younger kids and things like that. Where are you? Uh, where are you doing this out of? Uh, I do it out of Extreme Couture. I moved to Las Vegas from Michigan in 2012, May of 2012. So it's officially my 10 year, um, you know, anniversary per se. Uh, but yeah, I'm training and coaching at Extreme Couture. Um, I also train and coach, uh, fitness instruction at uh, true fusion Summerlin. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the kids and stuff, I, I run the wrestling program, kids wrestling program, adult wrestling program. And, uh, I, I mean, I, all, I do all my personal training and I work with all my fighters out of there as well. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and I'll tell you what, also, um, uh, you know, question, I mean, cause we've been on here for a little bit and, uh, sure. I don't want to take too much of your time, but, what is the future for martial arts for you? Like what, I mean, obviously I can see you probably going into training and uh, training fighters and things like that. Is that what you're looking to do? Or, you know, once, once you hang up your gloves, what do you plan on doing? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. I don't know yet, to be honest. And, you know, and the reason is, well, I do know, but I don't know. It's, I'm going to be very particular about who I train. You know, it's being on, I've seen all sides, you know, it's crazy because there's a lot of great fighters out there and I'm not saying I'm the best fighter in the world, but I've seen all sides. I've seen the coaching aspect. I've seen the training aspect. I've seen the fighter aspect, seen the referees aspect. So I I have a different view of everything. And, you know, one of my best friends, Roman Isbell, uh, runs a management company called RAI, uh, Roman Athletic Institute. And I see his, the management side. I mean, dude, there's just there's just so much crazy stuff going on behind the scenes between fighters and coaches and fighters and managers. And, you know, uh, say you have a fighter, say like Dennis Davis, my head coach, he's built guys up as an amateur. As soon as they turn pro, they leave him and they go with somebody else that's more uh, that they think is going to be better than him. You know, that's it, it's going to be hard for me to transition to coaching um, because, dude, I just I'm big on loyalty, man. 
you know, it's, you know, I've, I've lost a couple fights here and people have messaged me. Big gyms have reached out to me. Big coaches have reached out to me. Hey, come to our gym. Like we'll train you better and we'll do this. We'll make sure you're ready for your next fight. But my heart, my heart is with Dennis. My heart's with extreme couture. My heart's with Roman Isbell, you know, Dennis Davis head coach at extreme couture. I threw, I mean, when I wasn't making any money in 2009, 2010 as an amateur, you know, Dennis was there for me, traveling for me on his dollar, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, and, and that, and that stuff goes a long ways, you know, win or lose. So I just, I've seen how many fighters he's lost through the years and I'd hate to, you know, start to be a coach and put all my time and effort into fighters and them just dip out on me when they think something better's arrived. You know, I've had enough yeah. girlfriends do that. I don't need, I don't need uh, fighters doing that too. <laughs> Yeah, because sometimes you actually have to put more time into a fighter than you do a girlfriend. Dude, it's exactly. And at the end of the day, you know, you want your fighter to win, but at the end of the day, when the when the when the checks get cut, everyone gets tight. Yeah, because that's you know, I got these kids, these up and coming teenagers, man, and some of them have so much promise. I'm telling you, Marcus and Zion market here first. You heard it here first. These guys, and and you know what, I've been loyal to them since they were seven, eight years old. I travel to their tournaments for free. Like I've, me and Zion have been to California doing wrestling tur or grappling tournaments in California. Like, you know what I'm, I'm hoping at the end of this career, you know, he can, he, he'll be loyal to me as well. I flew him to Michigan, you know, out there, I told him if you want a national grappling tournament that I'd take him deer hunting in Michigan, flew him out <laughs> to Michigan, you know, and stuff like that. Like that, these, these, these things, you know, I've put time to this kid and you know what I'm, I'm hoping he stays with me and you know, it'd be, it'd be a super bummer to miss out, you know, for, for to miss out. But when I, once I'm done fighting, I hang up the gloves. I'm going into uh, – I'm taking my EMT course right now, uh, but I'm going to become a firefighter of Las Vegas. Okay. Okay. So it seems also that, um, you know, if you look at your Instagram and stuff, um, when you're not fighting to probably clear your head, you're doing fishing and hunting and things like oh, yeah. that. Is that, is that you know, what I'd it's be correct saying that's how you 100%. clear your head? I love, I love fighting. I love competing but fishing and hunting are my passions. Um, everyone asks, well, why do you fight? It's like, so I can afford hiding and fishing and have enough time off to be able to do it nice, do it when I want. Yeah. You know, that's, and that's actually, it's funny because I was taking my EMT class and this, this just was like two weeks ago. This, you know, big firefighter comes in, big bulky guy in great shape, been on the, been on the department for a long time. And he's asking everybody, why do you, why are you here? Why do you want to do this? And he, and he asked the first girl, she goes, well, I want to help people. And the guy says, okay, it's fine. And the next guy, well, what do you want to do? He says, well, I want to save lives. And the next guy, oh, well, I want to help people. And it's all the same redundant answer. And he gets to me, he yeah. goes, why are you? And I said, because I'd only have to work two days a week and the pension's great. And he looks at me with a stern face. He goes, that's the best and most honest answer I've ever heard. And it's, well, it's I can true. definitely see that. It's a, it's a hundred percent true though. Like, I, yeah, of course I want to help people, but I'm not going to do it for free. And yeah. I only have to work two days a week. Fuck, you know, that's four days a week of fishing I can do or hunting. Like that's, I'm dead serious. This is why I went into this career because it's physical. Um, I, you know, I'll get the benefit of, of, of helping people and I only have to work two days a week. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> like, and the pension is incredible. I have a, I have a friend that just retired from, you know, uh, Metro. He was in Metro for 20 years. He's making over a hundred K a year retired. Like, wow. what? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, so, most definitely. I mean, yeah, so, but, helping people is great and all, but I need to make some money too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know that's the thing. You know, when it comes down to it, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's not paying the bills. You know, uh, you can't pay your bills off of you know help. <laughs> you know? That's what I'm saying. So, and again, it's I'm not trying to put those. I, I'm just I just try to be honest and tell them like this is why, man. And if I need eight days off to go on a long hunting trip, I just ask my partner to cover my shift and we switch yeah. shifts. And I so 100 percent i wish you the best on your uh, upcoming fight and uh what uh what would you like to say like where can people find you um you know your instagram your facebook you know yeah for sure uh instagram is uh jay09mi uh it's just the first letters of my last name my favorite number nine and then i'm from michigan uh but just look me up at justin james on any social media platform um, I'm training out of Extreme Couture to shout out to my loyalty team over at Extreme Couture. We're prepping for Julian Lane. And I can't wait, wait to sling these hands. All right, man. I really appreciate it, man. You have a wonderful day, all right? But you too. Appreciate you, man. Talk to you. you. There's a cow, cow up. 
Tracks swarm around the cyber fire Running through the garden Trying to avoid the vipers Ready 